Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I admit I was uh, tempted by some of the other talks that are on in this slot, but I figured I'd better come along to this one, or it might have been a bit, uh, a bit flat. Uh, my name's Neil Brown. I work for SUSE Labs over in... I'm based in Sydney, in Australia. Um, we also have engineers in Canberra and Melbourne, sort of half of the eastern seaboard work covered. Um, when I'm not enjoying the beautiful scenery in New Zealand, which has been very nice, except when it's been raining, I uh, usually am either trying to remove bugs from the next kernel or maybe put new bugs in. Uh, do a bit too much of that. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is design patterns. The title you can see here is a little bit different to the title that's in there, and whether it'll be the same as the talk I'm actually giving, I'm not sure. You have to pick your title like six months in advance, and you tend to write your slides six hours in advance, and there can be a bit of a change there, but we'll see how we go. Design patterns. So this is kind of a companion to something I wrote and Linux Weekly News were good enough to publish uh, back, in, back in June of this year. It is different content though. If, if you read that, you're not going to hear all the same stuff again. Um, but you don't need to have read that to understand this at all. They're, I think, quite complimentary. If you enjoy this talk and you haven't read that, I'd encourage you to go use your favourite search engine to find it and uh, have a read of that too. It, um, covers the same sort of topic in useful ways. So, patterns. What are patterns? Patterns, I'm not talking about like Paisley and Tartan and Plaid here. I'm talking about the way we think. The process of thinking is, is seeing similarities between different things. Um, every idea we have in our head is, is separate from the thing in the real world that we're actually thinking about. And one idea matches multiple different things because that idea represents a pattern, a pattern of which there are multiple examples. And, and this is how we think. We have high-level patterns and low-level patterns. And we don't think about the fact that we're using patterns in our thought most of the time. It's just, it's just what we do. It's how the human brain is wired. So design patterns, maybe they're just patterns thinking about design, particular things we use. Um, thought processes we use when we're in the process of designing things. And it is that, but it's more than that. Um, it was more than that ever since somebody gave it a, more of a meaning. And uh, about, about 30 years ago, this guy called uh, Christopher Alexander, who I think is like an architect, not a computer architect, like a building sort of architect, um, came up with this idea of design patterns. And there's a quote. Um, design, he took design patterns as more than just having these patterns in our mind and working with them, but actually thinking uh, intentionally about patterns, um, identifying patterns, describing patterns, analysing patterns, communicating patterns. I guess moving these patterns from our thinking, where they always are, up into our discourse, into our conversation, into the words we use when we're talking to each other. So we're not just... So we can, yeah, I guess, reason about about patterns, sort of making them first-class citizens in our thinking. Each pattern describes a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment, and then describes the core of the solution to that problem in such a way that you can use this solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice. Now, that's something we all do. I mean, who has ever said, oh, I've seen this problem before, grabbed a bit of code, copied it, edited it a few bits? Yeah, a few, lots of hands go up there. But do you actually think about that process? Do you uh, reason about that process? So, a uh, bit of a show of hands after that one. Who has actually knows about this term design patterns? Most people. Good. Who kind of thinks about design patterns day to day, week to week, includes it in, in what you're thinking, what you're doing, how you work? A uh, small number of hands, still quite a few. Um, who who talks about them? Who includes it in their dialogue when you're talking to a colleague, when you're sharing a problem? Who, I guess, talks about design patterns? Yep, still a few, five, six hands, seven, that's pretty good. Still a smaller number, so... Any other questions? Well, yes, I guess the, the Book of Four. So design patterns originally started with uh, architecture. The, the Gang of Four wrote a book called design patterns and object-oriented programming or something like that back in the 90s, maybe. And they took this idea from architecture across into object-oriented programming. 
And um, if you've done any object-oriented programming, you've probably heard of um, factory patterns and your visitor and, and, and lots of others. And, and they're really useful patterns, really good to have. Um, but I want to go in this talk more than just, well, having a list of patterns and knowing when to apply them. Because, I mean, that book that I mentioned sort of has a long list of patterns in it and tells you how to apply them. And that's really useful. It's a really good thing to do. But it's only about object-oriented programming, right? And you might work in there. You might come across patterns that aren't that general, don't apply to all object-oriented programming. It may be just specific to your particular context, your particular application. Um, so I guess what my, I want to do in this talk is encourage you along that path. So I gave a list of questions of more and more um, intentional, more and more thoughtful use of patterns. And I want to encourage you to, to move along from wherever you are to think more intentionally about patterns, to realise that there's a real power in patterns, to learn to, to recognise patterns. I mean, who's sort of bought a new car and then suddenly they keep seeing other people have got exactly the same car? Sort of once this is something in your brain, you start seeing it everywhere. And if I can get patterns into your, the idea of design patterns into your brain, that you start seeing them more, you start using them more, you start talking about them more, then I think that is a very useful thing for your ability to program, your ability, the ability of a community, because um, patterns that I know about and I use are useful to me. But um, as with so many other things, use, if everybody uses them, it, it amplifies the, the value of them significantly. Um, so, to encourage you to encourage this understanding of patterns, um, where did else go? No button? No button. I button this time. Um, I want to talk about meta patterns. And this is a computer science thing to do. You go one level, other level of abstraction. Um, I want to help draw a picture of what a pattern is. I mean, maybe you all have a vague idea of what a pattern is. We, we've seen a few patterns. Um, but like, you know, it's, it's the, you can copy code without really understanding the pattern that you're copying. Um, in the same way, you can maybe use patterns without having a, a big picture of, of all of the, all the different aspects of a, that makes a pattern valuable um, and all the different things you need to look for, I guess, when you're trying to analyse a pattern, trying to extract well, what is the important pattern here. And so I want to try and find some patterns about patterns. And to do this, I'm going to, basically the rest of the talk, I'm going to walk through a series of examples, a series of patterns, and, and try and extract from them useful lessons, useful aspects of patterns in general. All the patterns I will list are really very simple patterns. Um, the reason being that I don't want to spend time explaining some fairly complex pattern to you. Patterns can be quite complex, and particularly the justification for a pattern can be really quite, can be detailed. So I want just simple patterns, so I spend the time more talking about the high-level concepts. In most examples, the patterns uh, come from the next kernel simply because that's where I hang out. That's the big body of code that I'm very familiar with. Um, you don't need to understand the Linux kernel to understand any of the patterns, I hope. Um, and you should be able to find similar sorts of patterns, maybe the same patterns, maybe similar sorts of patterns in um, whatever body of code you might work with. And not only, I guess, I mean, though I say the Linux kernel, I, there's lots of Linux kernel that I never see, um, like sort of file systems and block devices and VFS and... and um, whereas the network is all foreign to me. So it's, it's not even... So there may be other examples, better examples of these patterns in other bits of the kernel that I'm just not aware of. Um, and you might, and you might be able to help enunciate the patterns better. So first to start painting a picture of what a, what pattern, what a, what a pattern is, I want to kind of look at maybe a lower bound and an upper bound for the range of abstraction that a pattern is. And so my first example is for loop. Now, I'm going to just put that name up there, for loop. I'm sure something happened in your brain. You, you thought of something. There's, you have an idea yourself of what a for loop is. Um, just those two words conjure up maybe some examples, maybe a particular construct in a particular language, um, maybe a, a general sort of idea. Whether a, 
everybody has the same idea of what a for loop is exactly. I mean, hopefully roughly the same idea, but the particular details may well be different. Um, I mean, the point is there that just that name, just the name has a lot of power. I don't even need to show you what I mean by a for loop because you probably already know and that's one of the real power of patterns. Once you condense something useful into one or two words, into a short name, then it becomes much easier to talk about it, much easier to include it in your discourse. And so the fact that a pattern has a name is really important. And when, when you, it's really important to try and choose a name, choose a good name when you are finding patterns. So this is what I mean by a for loop. I wrote it in C. I should have, would have written an assembler, but it's a long time since I've written assembler, and I figured I'd make a mess of it. Um, I figured C is kind of close enough to assembler that it, you'll see what I mean. This is a for loop. You initialize I to zero, and you have a label again, and if I is less than 10, you jump out, and you can read the rest, but I don't need to spell it out. But you can imagine, or maybe you can remember, maybe it happens to you day to day, but if you're writing assembly language code, you're going to be using constructs like that. They're really very simple patterns, but you're going to be using them writing. You, you, know, you, you have a high-level idea of what you want to write. You think, oh, this is a loop. This is a for loop. I know what a for loop looks like. I don't have to kind of work it out from first principles every time. I just you know, write it down because I know what it is. And when you're reading a program, you say, oh, look, this is a for loop. It helps that the labels are like again and out, maybe, or you might use more meaningful labels. Is this a question? Yeah. <laughs> I figured there'd be some typos. Yes, you're right. <laughs> well, yes, I, I wasn't actually copying from a pattern. I was making it up as I went along. So, yes, I, I got that wrong. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, but, yeah, so this is a pattern. However, this is what the same thing in maybe other languages, Pascal, C, and Python. You don't need to know that pattern. You don't run the risk of making a mistake as much um, because the pattern is embedded into the language. It's already there for you. It's already been given a name. It's already been given a description. So in my mind, this is kind of a, a lower bound for the, in terms of a hierarchy of abstractions, um, which isn't a strict hierarchy, but anyway, a lower bound for what a pattern is. If something is already implemented, whether it's a language feature or as a library routine, it's not a pattern. It's it's a feature. It's something you can just use. I mean, there may be patterns for how to use it, but um, when we're talking about patterns, we're only talking of things above that. Ways to a pattern is a way to combine lower-level thing, basic functionality, into um, a, a higher-level construct that the language or library doesn't explicitly provide for you. Um, an interesting. Observation here is while Pascal C and Python all use the word for, so you think it's always a for loop, they're really quite different abstractions. Pascal iterates a Scala over either in steps of one or you can put a step there, but that's all it does. The for loop just moves the Scala. Um, and it goes up to nine, whereas the others go up to less than ten. There's another subtle distinction. C and Python are kind of both more general, but they're more general in different ways. And, and kind of the point there is that different people will see different things. Different people will see different patterns in the same examples, the same bit of code. So there's, um, obviously this is just one example and you can't extract the pattern from one example. Um, as we'll see later, you need two or hundreds is better. Um, but there are, and the different, different sorts of patterns you extract says kind of something about, about your experience, about the range of examples you looked at. Um, so, my lessons from the for loop is that this, this provides a lower bound. Is it implemented? Not can it be implemented, but is it implemented? If, if you're just using the implementation and don't think of it as a pattern. Um, they can be very language specific and often a pattern is used to work around a, a weakness in the language um, and that's a perfectly valid sort of pattern. In another language you wouldn't sort of need it. So, it can be very pattern language specific. Equally, it can be very application specific. Some patterns you'd use in the kernel you probably wouldn't use in QT or KDE or something. Different people see patterns in different ways. And as I said at the beginning, names are very powerful. And it's useful to, I guess, keep all these things in mind when you're look at, looking at patterns, realizing that um, because people, different, people see different, 
things different ways, you maybe need to be more explicit about why you made, made your choices in abstracting from a set of examples to a pattern. Um, so my next pattern is maybe I won't so what can we say about a an upper bound, an upper bound to um, patterns? What where does it get so vague, so uncertain that it's not really a pattern, it's more of a, a strategy maybe or a principle or something vague? I found it hard to actually put my finger on exactly where that would be, but I, I won't use this, this is kind of a useful example because recently I came across an attempt by someone um, to write a binary search. Now binary searches can be put into libraries, and sometimes they are, and the Linux kernel doesn't do it that way for reasons that sort of, kind of, I guess, addressed in the, the article I mentioned. Um, anyway, so I wrote a binary search, and it was appalling. I won't sort of show it. Um, they might end up seeing this, and I'll know it's them. Uh, but the, it, it roughly followed this pattern, though. You can see this in vagueness, some test. Um, because, as you will see in a little way, there's a couple of different tests that can go there, and they're both correct, so I can't just give one pattern that has a particular test there. Um, and then there's, if some sort of comparison, um, you can imagine these are going to be less than or maybe less than or equal to or something. Um, and the, the actual result of the, the sum test would always succeed. It would always go into the loop again and there was a break in there. So there's some extra little bits that I guess maybe you don't quite follow this pattern exactly. There, there was a break in there to get out. But it kind of looked like uh, binary search, but in some key ways it was wrong. We're going to see some more of those in a minute. Um, and so that as a pattern for binary search is too vague. It's not actually useful. It doesn't give you concrete advice, concrete ideas on how to, how to make sure you get it right, how to avoid bugs. And so this is kind of another, I think, the upper, upper boundary for the idea of patterns, I think, is something, it's got to be something that's concrete that gives you really concrete, definite advice about what to do. You've got a problem, you find a pattern, it gives you, it points you very firmly towards a solution. It doesn't leave, only leave things uncertain which aren't actually part of the pattern, I guess. So, interesting, so how can we, what, what should the pattern be? If that's not what the pattern is, what should the pattern be? And um, as I said, there's quite a lot of examples of this in the Linux kernel. I don't know if you can read all of that. It's not terribly important. Um, hopefully there's a top line you can read. I just, just give, use git grep to find every example in the Linux kernel source code where it says a variable called mid, or possibly just m, is assigned something divided by two. Because, now those aren't all binary searches. There's a, a few things that are definitely nothing at all like a binary search, but most of them are. And so you can go through and look at each of them. Sorry, I won't do it again. So you can go through and look at each of those and look for examples. And it's good. There's, there's well over a dozen distinct examples. And you can see at the top, there's uh, alpha's got an EX table and FRV has got an EX table. And they're probably really the same thing. It's not fair to call them two examples because it's almost certainly copied from one to the other. But there's lots of examples there. And so and I don't think I actually looked at every single one of these, but I looked at quite a few and found some, the sort of patterns you get. And here, one of the choices. This is a choice that actually has no real bearing on whether it's correct or not, uh, or even what it does. You can, you typically set, you know, low, which is also sometimes called left and sometimes called start, to zero and high. You can either set it to n, which is the number of elements in the array, or n minus one, which is the maximum, the last element in the array. Um, in the one case, you use less than, the other case, you use less than or equal to. In the first case, you set high equal to mid, and the second case, you set high equal to mid minus one. So these are, the, the result of both of those is exactly the same. It's really, I think, kind of frustrating that there are these two essentially equal implementations that are just different. Um, it means you can't say, well, this is how you do uh, binary search, because you might see the other one, and, and it's actually just equally correct. So it's frustrating, but a, a proper description of the binary search pattern really needs to identify both of those um, as two different alternatives. I think there's actually, I mean, these, these are both options where you're actually looking to find a particular element or fail. Um, there are times when you actually, you don't want to do that, you want to find 
the place where you'd insert this element maybe or, or you might treat every element as actually a range you just want to find which range contains um, the thing you're looking for. So there's some other variability there that I think doesn't necessarily need to follow either of those. But I haven't kind of analysed the pattern completely. I'm just really looking at examples. And so here's another couple of um, variations that I found. One of which, at least, I wouldn't have thought of myself if I was writing a, a pattern from scratch. That is, sometimes you'll normally you see mid equals low plus high on two to find the point halfway between low and high, obviously. But sometimes you'll see it more like low plus high minus low on two. Why'd you do that? Reason is because in that case, though it doesn't show in the rest of the code, high and low are actually pointers rather than integers. They're not indexes into an array, they're pointers into the array, and you can't add pointers. It's not allowed, but you can subtract pointers. You get an integer, you divide that by two, you can then add a pointer back to the int integer back to the pointer and it does the right thing. So that's um, another kind of thing you need to be aware of, you need to be aware why it is. Um, and sometimes you exit the loop as soon as you find a proper match, sometimes you don't. Now when I went to school, they taught us you don't do this. You have exactly one comparison every time through the loop because it's more efficient. But actually, this is kind of just as efficient. It C, the C compiler doesn't do the second comparison. It, it knows it's already got the value in the state flags and stuff, another, another jump. So it might be not what the academics tell you to do, but it actually is better. It works in, in a lot of cases. So I've got another slide with some, some binary search choices that I found in examining the Linux kernel. And that's kind of a point that we find patterns, we don't make patterns up, we find patterns, we discover patterns by looking. Um, and then we find deviations from that pattern and we wonder why we find these deviations. Look, the top one, I've just taken a little bit out of the middle of a binary search of hopefully, you'll obviously, which bit it is. It's, it's, we, instead of having the equals at the end, as we saw before, we got the equals test first, which is fine. But it's a very different test if sense data thing equals key or sense data thing equals key with some few extra bits added onto it, um, then you found it. Otherwise, you just do a comparison. Obviously, the less than greater than comparison will be ignore, will be honouring those top bits. But the equals comparison doesn't. So this actually doesn't do the right thing at all. Um, it doesn't do what seems to be intended. What net effect this has on the code, whether it, this is actually finding an error message to print out, I think, based on, or some, finding a message to print out based on a sense key from some SCSI thingy. I don't know SCSI either. Um, but whether it actually causes real bad behaviour, I don't know. But it violates the pattern and it's obviously wrong. Um, the next one, can you see what's wrong with that? It's a do while instead of a while at the top. Does that make a difference? Well, it's different from the pattern, so probably it does make a difference. Thinking about it, it makes a difference because if the array is empty, this will try and be referenced part of the array that doesn't exist. In this particular case, the array is a list of memory banks. And I guess if there's no memory banks, then you're not even going to get this far. So it could well be, again, that this code is actually, in reality, safe. But it violates the pattern, so it, it highlights there's something weird here. It's worth looking at. That's kind of the, the power, one of the powers of patterns. It helps you to find bugs. The last one is a lot more subtle, but I thought three examples look better than two. And that is, so the test is while, while left is less than right, which if we go back here, less than rather than less than or equal means high should be set to n, the number of elements in the array rather than the last element. Um, but here, right is set to 127. That's probably actually the last element. If you, I mean, it's probably in a... In fact, it is an array of 128 entries. The fact that it starts from, from 1 rather than 0 is also a bit odd too. I think the 1 is right and I think 127 is wrong. Um, but again, it violates, it does appear to violate the pattern. It's worth looking at. It'd be nice actually to have comments to say why it violates the pattern there. But um, the point is here is not so much that, oh look, there's some weird code in Linux kernel, but oh look, just understanding a pattern and looking at the code, these things jump out at you once you know once you have the pattern in your mind, it's sort of, gee, that's weird. It's weird and it's probably wrong, and in case, in fact, it is kind of at least technically wrong, I guess. Um, so what are the lessons we learned from binary search? 
Uh, patterns need to be precise. A vague pattern is, is really not useful because you think you can do, be doing the right thing, but actually you've missed the point. So patterns, re sometimes there'll be a number of, you know, a pattern will give a number of different sub-patterns. They need to be precise to be useful. Um, variation from the pattern often highlights bugs, and that's why they're really useful. That's why it's good to have these patterns in your brain, um, because it really does help you find bugs. Um, a wealth of examples yields a richer pattern. It's really good to see lots of examples. Um, and that's why big software projects are kind of particularly useful, because they, lots of particularly big projects that lots of people have contributed to. You know, there are lots of different brains, minds that have put useful stuff in the kernel or in any other project, look through and maybe you can gain from their wisdom or observe their carelessness. Um, uh, both certainly happen. This is a quote from, uh, you might remember, a long time ago now, so you've forgotten that the subtitle was an architect archaeological approach to understanding large software systems. This is a quote from an archaeologist. Um, that I found on some website with quotes from archaeologists. The first discovery of a unique and unexpected assemblage should be regarded as a possible accident. Even the second discovery should be a, could be a coincidence. In general, only repeated independent discoveries establish a pattern that merits serious behavioural interpretation. That just, um, I think there's a real synergy between that observation on archaeology and the fact that, you, you know, when we're looking for patterns, it really seems to be useful to look at lots of examples in the code before you really say, hey, there's actually a pattern here. Um, there might be aspects of it that you're missing and you'll come up with an incomplete pattern. Next pattern. Um, go to error. So this is a pattern that actually, as we'll see, occurs a lot in the kernel. Um, I don't have a lot to say about this, but just the way I'm illustrating the pattern is there's a bit of code that, that I wrote that I changed the previous, the, so the previous, this is a diff of just one little part of a larger diff that changed the function. You can see what it used to do is if it calls alloc disk and if that fails, it does some clean up and it unlocks something and it releases something and it returns an error. And I changed that to do hardly any, any clean up, maybe I should have done none, I'm not sure, and go to abort. And there are several other places in the code that now doesn't do any clean up there it just goes to abort. And abort, it does all the cleanup that's necessary. The reason for this is because I'd, I'd made a change to this bit of code, you know, a few weeks earlier, and someone said, hey, someone, I think they did some static analysis on bits of the kernel, and they noticed that I wasn't freeing something on one of the error paths. Now, see, I actually used to always prefer the former. I was brought up to not like go-tos, you know, Dice had that paper, that letter, which was titled... Um, Go to is considered harmful, and I read it and I kind of believed it. And I found that writing with structured code worked better than writing with go to's. And so I was always sort of felt unclean when I had to put go to's in. And I got to the kernel, I found there's all these go to's. I thought, oh, I can probably be mature about this, but I just won't write them myself. Um, but I guess this kind of was a turning point where I realised no, I'm just being silly. Um, it really is much safer and much better. It is a more valuable pattern. Um, to, to do it this way, and kind of the evidence is is this. Um, so what's this? This is another git grep, grepping through the code looking for things is kind of fun, I think. So we we grep. So the the sed basically strips out every label that's asked for a go to, and then we pipe that through sort unique dash c sort dash n to get kind of a frequency table of all the different labels that are true in the Linux kernel. There's about 11,000 distinct spelled labels. These are the 20 most common ones. And as you can see, a lot of them are some form of go to error. Might be go to er error, go to err, go to fail, go to bail, go to error out, go to out error. Wouldn't it be nice if we were standardized? Maybe. Fun? Yeah. All right. I didn't know that. I, I use it a lot, yes. It, it's cool. Um, you can get this sort of thing. Um, I did some other grips, and of the... So the 17,000, which you just go to out, and that might be go to out because we just had an error, or it might be go to out for some other completely unrelated reason. Um, so you can't really be sure what all those 17,000 go to outs are. But the 2,000, there's about 
thousand the error or error or something there. In the total set of them, labels which contain the three letters ERR in some form, there's 17,000 of those, 17,000 go-tos. So this, is, this sort of pattern, a go-to error, is really very common in the kernel. So those, those sorts of numbers should at least tell you this isn't something you should ignore. You know, when, when you see a pattern that this, this, is, that this is this prevalent, um, uh, ignore it at your own peril, which, in fact, I did. So um, patterns can be useful for teaching even old hands, it would seem. Um, so, yeah, the lessons there. Patterns can help avoid bugs. Um, actually, using the pattern helps you not hit, write the bug in the first place. And there's actually... Uh, a, you can turn that around. Um, finding bugs helps you find patterns. I've often... When I, I find that I've been hunting for a bug. I find the bug. A good thing to ask then is, how could this bug have been avoided? What sort of pattern could, could have been used to make sure this bug didn't avoid? So at that time, you sort of, you've got enough of an understanding of what actually happened because you've sort of traced through it to figure it out. You've got the right picture in your mind of the, of the big picture. As that it's, it's a good time to be trying to analyse those thinking, analyse all the examples you've looked at and think, well, what, what is the pattern here? And that, um, that's actually how the container of macro came about. I fixed some bug that was, I don't know if you know what container of is, it basically, if you've got a, an element inside a structure and you've got a pointer to the element, you can use container of to cast that pointer into a pointer to the structure, and that's used quite a lot in the kernel to kind of simulate object-oriented kind of sort of thingies. And uh, is that precise? That's a nice precise pattern for you, kind of sort of thingies. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd found some bug related that was kind of doing this, and I'd got something back to front. I can't remember what it was, but I thought, well, what? How could this be done better? How could this be done better? And um, after kind of I proposed something, discussed with the community, they said this is wrong and this is wrong, and you've chosen a stupid name, and we ended up coming with with container off, which um, is a really good example of it's an example of when to, one time it's good to look for patterns, and it's an example of how useful patterns can be. Um, wisdom of crowds should not, you know, if a pattern is really obvious, really popular, maybe there's a good reason for it, even if you can't see it yet. Um, how am I going? Two more patterns. Should be able to squeeze them both in. Accessor functions. I'll pick this because, I, I, again, I don't like these, um, but they're useful, and, and that, that sort of shows the point. Accessor functions where you have a function that all it does is access either set or get some particular field or some structure or something like this. And these are... I, I always think, I see this, why not just open code it? Why not just put the actual access there? It would make much more sense. It would be easy to read, but people don't, there must be a reason. I mean, it's, it's not as prevalent as go to error in the Linux kernel, but there must be a reason. In this case, this is um, in blockdev.h, this is accessing aspects of a block device. Um, max segment, max sectors might give you a hint. Bounce, page, fn, I can't remember what fn is. Anyway, the reason, as far as I could tell, looking at the different patches that led up to this, the, the instead of accessing, instead of open coding accesses to these fields, it's wrapped in a function, is because they wanted to basically move the fields out of the um, struct request queue into a sub struct within struct request queue, a struct limits or something. It's probably not actually listed there. And so, first had a patch that changed all the accesses to wrapped accesses using the accessor functions. It didn't actually make any functional change. And then the patch to actually make the functional change was much smaller and kind of easier to, easier to review. And, and there, is, there is some benefit. Uh, if, you, if you think you might want to change an implementation later, um, then it's easier to do it if you sort of ca encapsulate all the accesses in accessor functions. So maybe that's a benefit of it. Here's a couple of other accessor functions in the same sort of place. Um, the first one sets a bit, but it uses underscore underscore set bit which, I mean, this is a subtle kernel thing. Um, if you, the set bit function is, is a lock, it, it um, sets the bit in a way that no other CPU will see. And it will be, if, if two different CPUs set two different bits in a word, 
they won't tread on each other and one of them accidentally zero the bit that the other one has just set by doing a read, modify, write. So a normal set bit is, is atomic and there's a performance cost in that. Underscore, underscore set bit is not atomic. It may well, if two different CPUs try and set, use underscore, underscore set bit at the same time, they could trump on each other. And I guess the idea of having that queue set un unlocked um, is a way of the implementer saying, well, you know, we really want to get the performance benefit of using underscore, underscore set bit. So it's kind of a hint to people who are writing the code to do the right thing. Um, the second bit is, is similar, but also adds worn on once, queue with locks. So adding, a, adding sanity checks, adding debugging in general is a lot easier if you've got all these things abstracted into accessor functions. And there's, there's quite a lot of this accessor functions in the kernel, but I don't like them. And the reason is kind of, if you look closely shown here, um, a different set of accessor functions. There are flags, so there are structures in the kernel called buffer heads, and a buffer head's got a flag word, and there are bits, each bit's got a different name. One, for instance, bhmax says, I'm not sure what it says, it doesn't matter exactly. Um, and if you grep for bhmax in the kernel, you find it's only used by some of the newer file systems, ext4, gfs2, nilfus2. It's only used by that file system. It's, it is sometimes set. It's not explicitly cleared. Is it ever tested? Possibly. You can't actually tell for certain in some of that. Why, why would this flag be used, you know, such a little amount? And the answer is that um, most of the uses of this flag don't actually use bh underscore map. They use one of these macros. If you like C macros, you can figure out what they're doing. But basically, the macros are spelt in such a way that grep doesn't find them. Um, so basically, I don't like these things because grep, make, grep can't, often can't find them and tells you the wrong stuff. I like using grep to, to understand the code. And it increases your semantic load. When you're trying to understand new code, having all these extra functions is, um, is confusing. So here's a pattern that's kind of both good and bad. There are some real positive aspects of this function, and there are some real negative aspects of this function. And... Um, it's, so whether it's actually good or bad, whether it's, see, there is terminology, some people talk about patterns and anti-patterns, as though patterns are good and anti-patterns are bad, and, and there is some truth in that, but not all patterns necessarily, I think, fit into that, um, into that uh, dichotomy. So when you're looking for patterns, it's important not to, to be realise you're looking for patterns, patterns, whether they're good or bad or indifferent, patterns can help you understand the code as, Indiana Jones. I learned all my archaeology from Indiana Jones. He says that archaeology is a search for fact, not truth. I'm not sure if that communicates exactly what I'm saying here, but in the first instance, we need to find patterns without necessarily judging them, find out, understand them, work out what they do, and then judging them, assessing them is quite separate. So just quickly, my last pattern, which, which is kind of important, the KREF is a pattern in the Linux kernel. Um, it just helps you with reference counting. It's, it's kind of little simple wrappers for atomic ink, atomic, atomic adding and decrementing. The, the really cool thing about KREF is the name, KREF, is sprinkled all over the Linux kernel source code. If you read it, you'll see KREF, so this phrase will get into your brain. You might go looking for it, you might find what it is, but it's there. And so, so the, the point I'm making is, once, you, once you've got a pattern, how do you tell other people about it? And KREF, in that sense, is, I think is a success. Um, KREF occurs in lots of places and it helps people, it increases, you know, brain share. Um, go to error, on the other hand, it's spelt so many different ways that it kind of waters down the understanding. There's no one place you can go look for to find it. Well, what is this go to error? What is the pattern? Do you go and look for go to error or go to out or go to abort or go to whatever? Um, binary search, for instance, fortunately, is kind of taught in university, in high school even, and so... It's taught to people, and so they have it in their um, brains early. But when you come up with a pattern, how do you communicate it so many other people can see it? You can put it up on a wiki, maybe. There is a wiki for Perl design patterns, I found. Um, there's a comment on the front page that says, our DNS was screwed for months, so I guess nobody needs to... Well, there is activity on it. I don't know if it's by more than one person. I didn't look that closely. But you know, putting things on a wiki only works until no look there. Um, so, my last point about design patterns is 
if, once, if you've got a pattern, if you've identified it and analysed it and maybe told somebody else and they like it, to get it out of the community, you've got to put it somewhere they'll see it. And if you can actually get it into the code, um, whether in a function name, the KREF is in, it's in function names, it's in type names, and it's in include file names. Um, so people are bound to see it. And that's kind of got to be the, the goal, I think, to... There's no point, it's, there's much more value if not other people know about your pattern and obviously you need to convince them that it's a good one. So what has this got to do with archaeology? My final slide. I hope, um, um, we find patterns rather than making them. An archaeologist tries to find stuff. And most of what you find when you go looking is potsherds, just little bits of clay. They're not really all that interesting. I, I, one exercise leading up to this, I looked into... I chose a bunch of color codes of can I find any design patterns, and they're all things I really knew. Um, but nonetheless, if you know what you're looking for, if you know what a pattern looks like, if you um, look for it at the right time in the right way, there really are prizes to be found. Um, labeling is important in archaeology. You've got to label everything where it came from, and names are really important. And um, finds are worth more if you can find a way to exhibit them. Who wants? I guess some people like to keep their Indiana Jones signs in their own private um, space, but I think it's much better to... They're more valuable, certainly, in that open source world to share them. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Yep, you got a microphone. Yeah, I'm all the way over here, if you can just repeat the oh, question. Yeah, right, I'll just repeat the question. Um, particularly the, the binary search pattern that you pointed out, um, I'm not a general hacker, but in the Python program, what we do is we run a function for binary search, and then we throw a lot of the So what do you want to do with the pattern? Right. So, so, so the question is that um, I observed in the Linux kernel, the binary search is used is open coded multiple times, whereas something like Python in, in other sort of implications, you just stick it in a library. Maybe so maybe it's not a pattern, maybe it's just a case of we should be putting that code in the library. And the, there are a couple of different reasons for that. I mean there's a tendency in the Linux kernel to open code simple algorithms simply because it avoids extra function call off to the compare function. Because if you if you write binary search in a library, you've got to pass in a compare function and then the the library function has to call back out to the compare function, and there are um, case, cache pollution issues there, and there's efficiency issues. But also, there are actually a number of different variations of binary search, depending on whether you want to um, find a particular element or find where an element would go and stuff like that. There's a B search function in glibc, which either tells you where it is or says no. Now, if I actually want to know near where it was, it's kind of not, not so obvious how to use that. You could probably fake up a, a right sort of compare function, but it's, yeah, it, it's that sort of answer. I mean, it is a pattern that's used in the kernel. Other question? Uh, I'm not a kernel hacker. There are lots of other patterns in the kernel. For example, the structure of function pointers that is often used in things like the VFS to dispatch uh, control off to various file systems. Yep. Is there a a website on the net that does have uh, a list of kernel patterns that, that people looking to get into kernel, kernel coding can have a look at? Not that I know of. And a kind of, this is something I'd like to, to do something about. I'd, I'd like to kind of maybe create a, a more awareness of patterns, uh, create, in, encourage the creation of patterns. Um, but I, I don't want to create a wiki that nobody ever goes to. Well, I want to understand enough about patterns and how to get them in people's, how to communicate them to people. Um, and yeah, I could put a bunch of files in, in the documentation subtree in the Linux kernel, but I rarely go there myself. I'm not sure that I still go there very often. So you need to really have, people look at the code much more than they look at the documentation, simply because the code is up to date by definition, and the documentation may not be and often isn't. So you need to kind of have pointers. You need to, if you can get pointers from the code into the documentation, that people have to see, then that would be a really good thing and sort of open to, to ways to, to make that work better. I mean, certainly I agree. I mean, my, my article on Linux, Linux Weekly News essentially identifies a whole bunch of patterns and saying, look, here are some patterns and here are the good, just to kind of 
maybe increase the brain share of the concept. Thanks. That's actually all the uh, question time we, we have available. Um, LCA 2010 would like to, uh, to thank you for uh, coming to share that with us and the sponsor Fiasco Wines has offered a uh, bottle of white for you. Thank you very much. Thank you.